So um, we'll kind of get started tonight. Uh, I, uh, we'll, so what we're going to talk about tonight is chapter 19. We're going to talk about functions. Um, we're also going to spend some time talking about like the function basics and do some like practical stuff. Uh, I put together a bunch of examples. I put together a notebook with a bunch of examples that we're going to kind of cover. Uh, I think it's kind of to the point where seeing examples is really going to kind of help to facilitate like what we're talking about in the book. So I put that in in a thread for the, the Zoom meeting that popped up here in the Slack. So if you want to access that, download it and have it, you know, go for it. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is, well, we could do a quick five minute icebreaker if we want. I know we're kind of at the five minute, but these are kind of fun. Um, what piece of advice would you give your past self about learning R? So we've been going at this for about 20 weeks now, 20, 21 weeks. We're already through like two thirds of the chapters. If you could go back to day one in December, what's one bit of advice you'd give yourself to maybe facilitate your learning? Oh, I can go on. Um, I learned R far away a long time ago. So, but um, I saw that um, I should have learned R Margon sooner because it's really helpful and after you get more commands, stuff like that. So it's something uh, I wish that I knew before so I could co comment more, taking more. Yes, I, I would have, yeah, it would have been uh, an asset for me to know that at the beginning. Yeah, learning our markdown definitely helps. Anybody else? Monsa, any bit of it? Oh, Brian? I would have told myself to start like five years earlier. So I, 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 uh, I, I feel like I've lost time not having picked it up earlier. But at the same time, there's so many late, inter late uh, like recent innovations on it that uh, it would have just been learning and then relearning. So I guess I'm not too far behind. But man, I sure would have liked to have started a lot earlier. Yeah, definitely. I wish I could do that myself too. <laughs> I one time picked it up and then like took like a two year hiatus and then I came back and then it was like, oh man, things have changed. So Monsa, what about you? What, what bit of advice would you give yourself if you could go back? Mm, so R was the first programming language I learned. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I would have told myself to be less afraid. <laughs> I used to see something and then I used to just become scared and then not look at it for several days. But had I kept on going, I would have been a better coder. Yeah, I could, I can, I can definitely, I can, I, I can definitely agree with that. Like I always felt, I used to always have this fear, like I was going to break my computer <laughs> or like I was going to break the internet for some reason. Like I was always like, okay, I'm going to break Google or something. And then I remember sitting there one day, one day I had an epiphany and I said, you know, there's some really smart people who put the internet together and there's really smart people who work at Google. And so anything that I probably can mess up, they probably have a fail safe for. So, um, but I, I definitely agree with you on that. So I actually almost broke a module in, in my computer cluster because of some R updates. So. <laughs> Yeah, that some of that like bigger like computer science stuff and like admin stuff like I yeah. still get kind of nervous about but <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like there's like a really smart people out there that have made these fail safe so anything that I do unless I'm doing something really really like terrible like there's probably a fail safe for it but that's a good point. Um I guess mine is, is like, Go ahead Ryan. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to say, don't you love it when it's like an error occurred? Please contact your administrator. And you're like, I am the administrator. I have no <laughs> idea what to do. <laughs> that happens to me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> or, or that tense moment that you have when you're going to run like a delete, like, you know, delete on like SQL. You're like, did I back this up? Yes. And then you hit it. <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. So. I think the biggest bit of advice that I have is uh, that I would give myself is probably read more of the documentation. So I think opening it up and like reading the documentation in R, because sometimes that makes more sense when you read that rather than doing like quick Google searches and like trying to re like read through like Stack Overflow, because it just kind of helps you like better understand like what's going on. Mm -hmm. So if I could go back and tell myself, hey, 
start reading more documentation. That's what I would do. Cool. So that was good. Um, so just some quick housekeeping. I think we're all pretty familiar with these now. We've been going at it for 20 weeks, so I shouldn't have to remind you of any of these. The big one is if, if we need to slow down and discuss, just let me know. Um, most likely someone else has the same question or because we're getting into more advanced stuff, I for sure will probably miss something. So don't be afraid to stop me. You're not gonna hurt my feelings if I miss something and we need to discuss it. So, but the rest of these you pretty much know and I don't need to cover it more in depth. So tonight's discussion, we're gonna talk about functions. Specifically, we're gonna talk about when we should write a function. We're gonna discuss how to write functions. So some of the basic steps. We're also gonna talk about conditional execution using if else structures to modify the behavior of our functions. Then we're gonna talk about function arguments. And I think that's pretty much all we're gonna be able to get to tonight. Um, so some of this information from the chapter, which is like return values and environments, we'll talk about probably half of next week. So we won't get through all of it, but this is what I'm hoping to get through tonight. Uh, just a couple of quick notes. Uh, this chapter only talks about function basics. And so um, if you're looking for some more in-depth discussion on how to write functions or more in-depth discussion on how each one of these individual things work, I'm going to push you to Advanced R. It's another book written by Hadley, Hadley Wickham. It has like four, even five different chapters on functions, specifically diving into each of the pieces that we're gonna kind of briefly overview tonight. But if you are somebody who kind of knows functions and have been working with functions, advanced R is a great next step to kind of work through some chapters to get kind of a more in-depth understanding of them. But again, tonight we're gonna be mainly, mainly focusing more on kind of like the uh, practical applications of it and some of like the basic overview of it. So, and then the other thing that to take note of as well, um, we're kind of at a transition point within the book. Before we were talking about using R as an interactive tool for data science and program or data science. And so what we were doing is we were already relying on predefined functions for ourselves to kind of interactively do our data analysis. But now in the book, what we're doing is we're transitioning into more of programming. And so trying to program our own functions and our own code so that we can do um, data science for ourselves and for us to create functions and tools that we need to do our work. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting thing and a kind of an interesting note to kind of say like, hey, we're making this transition. We're no longer talking about it as an interactive data science tool but actually developing our own tools using functions. And the great thing is we've already been using functions. So uh, we'll talk more about it, but you know, um, functions shouldn't be too scary because we've already been using them. But now what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna start kind of digging into, oh, you know what, I'm not even, am I sharing my screen? No. I'm not, am I? Sorry, totally forgot about that. <laughs> Uh, can everybody see my my notes? Sorry about that. I thought I was sharing my screen. I'm just talking into the ether. So <laughs> apologies about that. Um, so anyways, here's, here's the chapters for advanced R that I was talking about. There's functions, environments, conditions. That's available to you. You can look at that. I've linked it in the notes. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've been talking about functions all along. So, you know, we're already kind of comfortable of how to use functions, but now we're going to kind of dive, dig into what functions actually are and how to write them and how to use them. So let's just start with like the basic anatomy of a function. And anytime that we talk about functions, there's three basic components that you need to know. Uh, the first one is name. The second one are the arguments. And the third one is the body. So we're gonna talk about each one of these in turn and kind of talk about some of the, the best practices around you know, specifying and defining a function. But really when you think about a function at its base kind of explanation, it's just made of three different components. It's based on the name, it's based on the arguments, and then it's based on the body, which is the actual code that we're gonna write. So anytime that anybody mentions a function, just keep these three components in mind and these are the three basic things that you're gonna be kind of defining to create your functions. So let's talk a little bit about 
um, functions in the wild. So I've we've already kind of talked about that we've been using functions and that we're kind of familiar with functions. What's nice about this is that we can actually look at the functions that we've been using and how they're defined. And so I'm going to kind of talk about some stuff that are, is not talked about in the book, but can kind of give you a better understanding of like how you can kind of pick apart functions in the wild. One thing that you can do is if you ever want to see like the body of a function that you're using, what you can do is you could enter in the name of the function without the parentheses. And what's get, what gets printed to the console is the actual body of the function. So for example, I'm going to jump over to my R session here and show you geom bar. But if you're ever interested in like what a function looks like, you can go over to your console and I have to bring in just bear with me here. I have to bring in tidyverse here real quick. But what you can do is you can type in the function name without the parentheses and you can get the function body to actually return. And so when we're looking at this function geom bar, which we've already been familiar with, with ggplot, we can kind of see the internals and the body of the function itself. In addition to this, it gives us the information of all the different arguments that are available for that function printed to our console. So if you're ever out in the wild and you want to see like what a function looks like, you can do this kind of quick trick to kind of get a quick printout of what the function internals look like, what the body of the function is to kind of get a sense of it. Now, this doesn't work in every case. Um, there are some, some functions, they don't, they're not traditionally defined like we're going to talk about tonight, but this might be just kind of a quick way for you to kind of diagnose how a function specifically works. Some other things that are out there too, um, you can also use the uh, structure function, the str. This will give you some kind of the same similar information. So if I go stir, whoops, I'm going to go stir geom bar, it kind of gives you the same information. It kind of gives you the function that it's a function, and then it will also give you all the function arguments as well. Another one that you can use is this args function. So if you're like working with a function, you can't necessarily remember all the arguments, which we'll talk more a little, little bit later you can use this args function to pull the arguments for that specific function. So if we go to geom bar here again and type in args and go geom underscore bar, it will give us all of the different arguments that are available to you. So it's, it's pretty similar to structure, but it will formally give you all of the um, arguments there for you. So and then the last thing is, if you really want to dig into a package's functions, a good place to look is GitHub. Now, not every package that you are going to use out in the wild while you're using R is not going to be hosted on GitHub. And so, but if you are using like the Tidyverse package, so Tidyverse is pretty good about this. They have open repositories on GitHub where you can actually go and look at all of the, all of the functions. So if you ever wanted to, you could go to GitHub and you can dig into the specific package itself. So this example, what I'm looking at is ggplot2. Um, I'm gonna try and see if I can find geom bar. But anytime that you go to a package and you're trying to find the specific functions, usually it's stuck in the R directory of it. So if they're following standard package, if they're following like standard package practices and an organization, all of the functions should be in R, this R folder. And you can kind of go through and you can kind of look for the specific file that you're looking for. In my case, I'm looking for geom bar. I found it. I can dig even further into the specific internals for that specific function. Now, again, this is going to be more complex than we're going to talk about tonight, but if you're interested in how a function is written and it's hosted on GitHub, you can access this information and dig a little bit more into it. But discussion of GitHub is a little beyond what we're going to talk about, but it's still just kind of nice to know that you can access all of the source code in R, or you can access the source code on GitHub if the package is hosted there. Okay, so let's talk about when we should create a function. So I've kind of fallen into this advice. Uh, this is the kind of the principle that I follow anytime that I need to write a function. 
So according to the authors, you should consider writing a function whenever you've copied and pasted a block of code more than twice. And so pretty much any time if I am writing code myself and I see myself having a bunch of repetition and I've copied and pasted more than twice, I'm going to see if I can write a function really quick to, you know, facilitate what I'm actually doing. So that's kind of like the first kind of rule of thumb to kind of say, okay, should I write a function here? Okay, if I've copied more than twice, this is, this is what I should be following. Some other things, some other reasons of when we should create a function is when we're trying to remove unneeded repetition to find errors. So the book has a really good example of this. And I'm going to pull it up because I thought it was the best example. But um, in the book, they had this example here of this function that they created. And basically what this example was trying to exemplify was this idea of um, that it's hard to find errors in a bunch of repetition. So did anybody, when they were reading this, did you catch the error that was there in this code chunk? Does anybody want to take a guess at where the error is? <laughs> Sa the, Sandra, the, the, yeah, yep. you have twice. Yeah. Yep. So it's this one right here. So you have the DFB, how it's kind of how it's um, how it's kind of hidden here, but you can see that there's a clear error. Well, it's not really clear, but there's this error right here for this should be a B rather than an A. But the point that the book was trying to make is because there was so much repetition within this, it's really hard to kind of see those basic errors. And then the other issue that this comes up is that you're not going to, this, this code will run and it will return a value and you will not get an error. And so you will get the wrong answer with this code. And so functions help us take out some of this repetition so that we can easily pinpoint errors a lot easier. And I reference you to the book to kind of see how Hadley went about like solving that. And it kind of walks you step by step of how he kind of goes about kind of fixing this issue and turning this kind of code chunk into its own function. The other thing that's out there too is reduce the number of times you need to make changes and updates. And so it's this principle called the dry principle. Do not repeat yourself. And I'm going to share with you kind of a practical example that I have to kind of exemplify the dry principle. So how many of you have ever created a bunch of plots before and you take your GG plot code and you just do the copy and paste? Oh, I need this bar chart. I'm going to do a copy and paste. I'm going to do another copy and paste and copy and paste. And before you know it, you have a thousand lines of code with a bunch of GG plot code to it. So to kind of exemplify this, or to kind of give an example of this dry principle in action, I've kind of had this, um, and I'm gonna bump out of here real quick so I can see it, but I have these three plots here. I've already kind of broken my principle of doing the copy and paste three times. So there is some code in here that I can turn into a function to make this um, a lot easier uh, to manage if I need to make a change. Does anybody wanna take a guess at what code in here I could turn into a function to better manage any changes that I need to make to these three plots. Does anybody want to take a guess? This one's challenging. What's your question again? So my question is, is looking at this code we have three repetitions of code. What part of this code could I potentially turn into a function so I could manage it a little bit easier if I need to make changes? Is that clear enough? The difference is, um, is your x. Your only difference is x. So basically, you need to find a way just to, uh, to change x. Yeah, so I could do that, right? So I could write a function where, because the only thing that really changes is displacement or the x variable. So I could write a function that has an argument to pass along um, the x one. That wasn't the one I was necessarily thinking about, but yeah, you could do that. Um, I'm going to talk more about that in iteration um, because that's kind of like an iteration problem. Yeah. 
But look at this one. Theme is pretty much the same thing over and over again. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience before where you've had to create a bunch of plots and then you add this kind of theme labeling to it to like to do the theming. And then someone comes and says to you, hey, uh, these are great. These plots look awesome. Um, but can you make the title a little bit bigger? Okay, well, if I have three repetitions of theme, I'd have to go through and change it three times. So if somebody wants this to be bigger, I'd have to change this three different times. Now, these are only three plots. It's not that big a deal. But to give you an example of a project that I'm working on, I'm working on a survey that has over 54 questions and I need to create a plot that's pretty much similar. It's just a bar plot looking at proportions of answers. I'm not gonna go through and change 54 plots just to change the title size. So what I can do is I can turn this into a function to make it easier to manage. So what I can do is I can define this function called column theme and it contains my theme information within it. And so all I have to do is change this function and apply it to all of my ggplot code. So I have plot one, plot two, plot three. And so if I run this, it still gets the same theming, but if my boss comes back to me and says, hey, Colin, I think the titles are a little too small. Can you bump them up? Well, all I need to do is go back to my function change the size one time, redefine the function, run it again, and now I have a bigger title in all three plots. So a good reason for why we wanna think about creating functions is because it helps us not repeat ourselves so that we can manage our code a little bit better, especially if we have a lot of repetition and we need to make small changes to it. So. This was the first thing that I thought of when I saw the drive principle. I was like, okay, I do this a lot, you know, where I'll create a bunch of, where I used to create a bunch of plots and then someone would come in and say, hey, change the size of this small thing. Oh, shoot, I got to go through and I got to change all of them. Well, there's a better way. We can create our own function and just apply it to this. So, uh, let's see. Oh, so examples of notebooks. So this is a good segue. Does anybody have any questions about what we've kind of discussed with like function anatomy, digging into functions, or when we should go about creating a function. We good? <laughs> good. All right. So let's kind of jump on to the next thing. So how do we actually go about writing functions? And so there's some basic steps that you need to do, and we'll talk about each one of these more in turn. But the first thing that you need to do is you need to pick a name for the function. And to be honest, this can be very challenging. And we'll talk more about like some of the specific rules of naming that was discussed in the book. But um, the, thing, the first thing you gotta do is you gotta pick a name. The next thing you wanna do is you wanna determine the inputs. What are the arguments that you're gonna have or what arguments and what inputs do, does your user need to supply for the computation to take place in your function. After that, you need to develop your code inside the body of the function. And we've talked about this already a little bit, but all of your code needs to go inside of the curly braces. And so a pro tip that was talked about in the book, it's always easier to start with working code and then turn it into a function. And so if you go back to that example that Hadley had in his book, and I'm going to go back up here so you can see it. This function right here, he kind of took the step of like developing this code and then creating a function from it. And so I've always found that to be kind of a, a successful tip too, is just get the code to work and then develop a function from it. Um, because it kind of helps you see the end goal and then you can kind of work backwards to kind of make that function itself. And then the last thing is check your function. You should be asking yourself this question. Does the function work in all cases? Most likely than not, there are gonna be some edge cases where the function does not work and it's gonna error out. So make sure you document those. Try and find those, those, try and find those cases where your function does not work and make a documentation of it. So you can kind of know the limitations of where your function fails and where, it actually, or where it's appropriate to use your function. 
Now that's kind of getting more into like the documentation parts, getting into like the, the package development stuff, which isn't really talked about in this book, but it's always kind of good to kind of think in your mind when you're creating functions to think, okay, where does this work? Where does it not work? Where is it appropriate to apply this function? And then the last thing is, can you create unit tests to check if your function works, works as expected? Again, that's a little bit beyond this book, but you could write formal tests or you can use functions to check your functions. So um, that, like I said, that, that gets a little bit beyond what we're talking about, but you could create functions to check your functions, basically. If I may, um, Colleen, it's just because every time I write something and I share with someone when they don't know R, I have an issue because it's, the argument is not the type they want, they ex expected stuff like that. So sometimes if you share a function with someone, it's all this question you have to, uh, you have to take care because after you have your user say, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's just because they are not able to check out if the argument is the one expected by the function. But it takes far away a lot of time to do that, far away more time than just to copy it all the time. So it's a balance between how you are going to use the function. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, it kind of goes back to like that quick note that I had at the beginning is like we're, we're transitioning from interactive analysis into, you know, programming uh, for data science. And, you know, it takes a lot of work to think through these things. And it takes a lot of work to create something for other people to use. And so, you know, just an example for me, like when I write a function and I create a function's arguments, I might name it something that I think works for me, but then when I pass it on to someone else, it doesn't make sense. And so you, you have to kind of balance. And like you said, you kind of have to balance that, like how much development time do I want to put into creating this function? And how much time do I just want to just copy and paste and make it easy? And I've made those decisions a lot too. So I, I definitely can empathize with your position on that. <laughs> um, anybody else have that experience, Monsa? Have you ever passed your functions on to anybody else? I have been on the other end. <laughs> <laughs> or, or the same thing. Yeah, you've been on the other end too, or you've received a function from somebody and you're like, uh, I have no idea what this is. Yeah. Or, my, or my favorite one is my previous self. Like I've created a function. I come back to it like two years later or like a year later. I'm like, what was I thinking? Like, I have no idea what this does. I wish I could go back and tell myself the stuff that I know now to fix that function. So, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Monsa. Did you have some more? No, no, I was just saying that uh, I have made, I, now I make it a point to write very elaborate comments whenever I write anything so that I remember what I did. Even if they, even if they don't, even if they seem too long for that moment. Yeah, excellent. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more about commenting out your code, because I think that's one of the most important things is being able to explain to somebody um, why you're doing certain things. And so we'll talk more about that. But yeah, definitely. Um, so I've just kind of broken it down into these three, these three things about when you about how you go about writing a function, you name it, you decide the arguments, you create the body, and then you check it. So that's basically if you kind of do that process, you, you do a good job of, of creating your functions. So let's talk a little bit about the behavior of a function. Uh, if you know this one thing about functions, you pretty much have a good sense of, well, I shouldn't, be, I shouldn't be so general about this, but if you understand the standard return rule, you get a good sense of like function behavior. Now there are exceptions to this function and we're not gonna talk about them or exceptions to this rule, but at a at pretty much a foundational level, all functions follow the standard return rule. And the standard return rule is this, a function returns the last value that is computed. So here I've defined a function here. I'm just gonna call it the Y function. It has one argument X. It does some basic numeric computation. But looking at this, can somebody tell me what's the value that would be returned from this function? What do you think? So Sandra says two. Monsa, what do you think? Yeah. It's going to be two. So Sandra, why, why, why is it going to return two? Uh, it's just because you wrote, um, you wrote, you wrote the last value that is co be compute. So it's it's y. So it's it's okay. 
Just yeah. I say that because it's returned less value. Yep, because it's the last value, right? So I define Y as X plus one. Here's Y. I define Z as X plus three. And then I do Z. But because I run Y the last time, that's what gets returned according to the standard, uh, the standard return rule. And so it took me a while when I was first learning functions to internalize this idea that, and we'll talk more about environments next week, but in this function, it has its own kind of container that it has like its own definitions in. And the only way to return something back to the bigger container, which is known as the global environment, we have to return what, what the, we have to return it by setting that as the last thing that's returned. So in our case right here, since Y is the last thing that's run, that's what's going to get returned. And because I put X equals one, we're going to get X plus one, which is two. That gets assigned to Y. Y gets run. We get one. Okay. Functions sometimes play a lot of mind games. You got to kind of like really think through it. So like this simple example, you know, you can kind of see how functions can get kind of uh, complex really quickly. And also but, my understanding was a function only can return one object. So if you want uh, several um, stuff, you need to put them in a list. Yes, uh, there are ways to return more values. And I will admit that I've tried to figure that out and it's a little bit beyond what my understanding of functions. But I've, I've kind of just internalized the, like, the foundational thing, like it returns the last thing that was computed. <laughs> And if it's a list, then you get list items back. If it's a number, you get a number. So just kind of like starting out, it's just always good to remember that it's going to return the last thing that's computed. But yeah, definitely. There are ways to get more stuff out, but that's a little beyond um, what we're going to talk about tonight. But that's a good point. Do you know, do you know how to tell whether it's going to print something out or not? So... Uh, so I get the idea that the last item is what gets returned, but under what circumstances would it actually print out um, in this, you know, what are you, so Y function X equals one. Um, and so Y is valued at two, right? So, uh, so as soon as you call Y underscore function X equals one, you hit enter and then it prints out two. Yeah, yeah, basically. And so, like, if you wanted to, like, print Z, if you wanted to print Z to the console, now, if it gets yeah. printed to the console, it doesn't necessarily exist in your global environment. You could wrap, like, a print function around it so you could, like, print Z, but Z doesn't exist. It exists in the environment of the Y function, yeah. but it doesn't, because functions, according to the standard rule, only push out the last computation it won't push that out to the global environment. Okay. Um, we'll talk about environments a little bit probably next time, but you got to think of like your global environment, which is a container and each function has like its own separate container inside of it. And so um, Z, so, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, so does it assume it'll only print it if it's printable, I'm guessing, or um, like I'm trying to think, is there a way, is there a difference between returning something uh, and not printing it? Or is that possible to return something and not print it? Uh, like, like a function, for instance, can you return a function, but it doesn't print out the function. It just, it, it runs through the steps or maybe that's, maybe that's maybe, maybe a better example is <clears throat> um, if your Y function was only Y gets X plus one, zero gets, or a Z, gets x plus three and that was it that was the entirety of the function <clears throat> then you would run the function but nothing would ever print out because it's only assigning things is that safe to say yeah no i, I see what you're saying like i think you're kind of getting into this i think because this is something that i don't know yet but like you're getting into kind of the stuff known as like function factories oh, maybe. so and you also got to remember like uh, functions can be objects too. So you could write a function to create a function. Yeah. Um, that's a little bit beyond like what the, like this chapter talks about, but like, you got to remember pretty much you could, anything in R can be an object. 
And so if your, if your, if your function creates a function, you can assign that to an object and have that function push out that function. Yeah. I know that kind of gets, that kind of gets like, like yeah. very abstract, but it, it's possible. <laughs> so it, do you, do you have this code already in, in R? I was going to see if um, maybe we could just run through it real quick. <clears throat> so you take that and then let me see the behavior of a function. You yeah, probably so, don't even really need all of it. Just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you, so I assume you've loaded in. Yeah. So then that prints out two because it's calling that last action, that last line, which is Y and just Y by itself means print out Y. But if you take that Y and you assign to it a new option, a new object, a new value, I don't know, a hundred or your name or whatever. Now, if you, now when you run that, is it going to print anything out? Uh, nope. It just defined it in my function. Like I, I'm looking over at my console, and all it did yeah. was it just assigned it. Um, but again, you got to think of it like, uh, I mean, what you could do is you could explicitly say return. I think. Yeah. Let me see if I explicitly say return. Ooh, I don't know. Let's just see what happens. I don't know. Nope. It will do the same thing. But if I did, you know, if I said Y, but again, we got to think of it like, does Y still exist though? Does Y exist in the global environment? So Y, no, it doesn't. Oh, the Y it only exists in the environment of the function. So, oh. but if you wanted to return Y, you could, if you wanted to print Y to the console, you could, you know, you could explicitly say return Y and it would return it to the global environment and you should get a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. It gets, it gets different because you got to keep, you got to keep in mind the environments, right? It's a separate contain. The way I think of it is it's like a separate container. So, yeah. but that's a good point. I never that's thought of that. Interesting. And even if you have an assignment and like you hit, like you do in line 174 and the last uh, printable object was line 173, which is, uh, sorry, I was saying w without line 175, if you take out line 175. Mm -hmm. so like it's not those. even going to go, yeah. It's like it's not even going to go back and print out Z. It's, it's completely. That's a good point. Z because it's not the last, it's not the last statement. Yeah, but I'm wondering if you can return Z explicitly like this. Return Z. Yeah, probably. I don't know if you could do this, but let's just see. I mean, we're playing around with it. Yeah, it returns four. Wait, object Z not found. So actually, I don't think, well, it does return it because in the function, it returns it, but it still runs this last computation. But we explicitly had return Z, which is four, but it doesn't exist in the global environment. Yeah. <laughs> from, from inception. Function fun is what I'm going to name it. So fun with functions. Um, and this is like the basic stuff. Like when I look, oh, sorry, Sandra, go ahead. It's just that it's the case. Some people, they put, sometimes you have the, uh, you have to put uh, twice the sign, uh, this one, this one, and the error. You could have, you could make the value assigned in your global environment. If you put um, um, the- and The double arrowhead. This, yes, uh, the minute, uh, the inferior, uh, the, this side, yes, I think that is maybe it should work. I believe that is the difference between global environment, local variable, and uh, no, it doesn't work. Okay, but I saw that it would work. Hmm. Yeah, it should work. I... Hmm. It's funny that it doesn't. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I, I, I remember reading about this briefly. Oh, oh you know what it, what it is? Um... It's if you have if you have a global variable already that's not part of the of the function. So it's like if you declare if you assign y outside of the function, very at the very beginning y and just yeah give it some number. Uh, a different one. Yeah, one seventy five. Yeah. So now it should return y as as a hundred or yeah, it was 175, even though you, wait a second, what in the world? Mm. So first it became 175 and then within the function, you assigned it the value of 100. 
Oh, we know it might be messing it up as this return Z, so I'm just see if that. Then it returned 100. Okay. Because it was that return Z, because we were explicitly saying return Z, we weren't saying return Y. Okay. So I think that's what the issue was. So if I run this all again, it should be 100. Yep, 100 gets returned. Okay. So fun okay. with functions. <laughs> And these are the simple thing. These are like the simple things. Like when I look at like the dplyr stuff and I'm like looking through it, I'm like, I have no idea how you would parse this function apart. Like, cause yeah. there's just so much more complex logic that's beyond what I know. So, but. So if you change that Y gets a hundred like that, change the Y variable to like a G or something that we haven't used yet. I, cause I wonder if, uh, no, I mean, um, I don't mean I don't mean the the value of y. I mean the variable that you're currently assigning g to. Assign it to a different variable because I wonder if the function can actually create a global variable. So like no. Uh, so uh, in line 175, instead of y gets g, make it like uh, um, b gets g. So we have. Because I think that double arrowhead does it, it, it transcends the function environment and goes out to the global environment. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wonder if, if it would create B. So it does, it creates B. Because mm -hmm. while well, it returns G, the string yeah. G. Yeah. So, hmm. So, okay. That's so interesting. You can, create, you can actually create global variables. From within functions using that. I mean, I would almost be careful with this though, because, well, maybe not. I mean, yeah, because you would probably want to use the function, you know, you would want to use the function and explicitly define it outside of the, in the global environment. Yeah. But I don't know, there might be some trade-offs to that, but it's, it's a little bit beyond what I'm thinking right now, but I don't know, there might be some trade-offs to using this double arrow. Now, the only thing I saw that is when I'm using code uh, I got from data scientists and when they have some, a lot of recall of function, of function, of function. So sometimes they do that. And for, yes, when I, I use code higher uh, written by um, very, very good people, I saw this kind of stuff. Mm. And, and there's, I'll oh, go ahead, Ryan. For what it's worth, uh, I think I read on a, a blog or maybe in one or two places that the double arrow is, is actually not generally accepted practice. I only saw it once and I don't know the reason. I don't even know if that's true or if it's just one person's opinion, but it, it may be something. And I don't, I don't remember the source either, but um, it, uh, it's something that I want to look into a little bit more. I mean, I think it's because you, like you want to keep the environment separate, right? And you only want to explicitly define in the environment. Mean, that's the way I view it right now with my, you know, naive understanding of it. But like, it seems like if you're doing this, you're like bleeding your environments together. And that seems like it could get confusing really quick, but take, take that for whatever, what it's worth. <laughs> yeah, I read somewhere that if that, um, when, when you define a function, then the novel first look inside for, for the value of the variables. But if they're not defined inside, then, then it'll start looking into the global environment. So if had, had we not defined Y within, within the function, then it would have checked the global environment and then produce the result using, using the Y from outside the function. I think that's also something to be careful about. Yeah, that's right. Because functions always look up a up a up an environment, right? So if you had a function within a function, and this was like nested, you would have two environments encapsulated, and it would always look up. So that that's a good point too. Or it would always look outside. I guess is kind of what I'm thinking. <laughs> like I said, I kind of have like half baked like mental images of how this all works. So like, if it doesn't make sense, please like let me know. <laughs> um, okay, cool. That was a good conversation. That kind of cleared some things up. Uh, so here are those five key steps again. Pick a name, list out the inputs, place code in the body of the function. Uh, the other thing is aim to make your function human readable. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a second and check your function as well. So naming your function, uh, some kind of basic practices. Names are important, but also realize that they can change. Uh, so don't stress. If you're kind of trying to create a function, you can't name it and you can't figure out a good name of it, just give it a name and it can always change. 
a good example for uh, people who kind of remember dplyr back in the day. I guess I've known R long enough to say back in the day now. They used to have functions called spread and gather, uh, and they they might be they're newer defined functions, but I kind of think of it as a name change. They changed it to pivot wider and pivot longer, and so. If the tidyverse crew can do this, they can change names. Certainly we can change our function names as too. So don't stress about your names too much because they can change. I I still to this day don't un, don't really understand spread and gather. Uh, I'm so glad that they changed it to pivot wider, pivot longer. Um, when it comes to naming, clearly denote what the function does. Uh, so, you know, I always try and strive for being descriptive. Uh, sometimes that leads to longer names. But, you know, it, it makes it more clear for somebody else. I'm going to pass on to somebody else or my future self. I'm going to know what this function actually does. So some of, more people are saying, well, Colin, I want some rules. I want some rules to follow about naming. Well, the book talks about some like generally accepted practices that you could follow. Uh, the book suggests that your function should be a verb. However, um, you can use nouns in your function names as long as they're like well-known nouns, like mean, that's clearly uh, a clear noun, like you're calculating a mean. Or if you're using, or if you're like creating some type of object prop property. Aim for clarity, but be descriptive. Again, my own workflow, I aim for being descriptive, which to my detriment makes long variable names, but it's just gonna help me later on. The other thing we've talked about this a long time ago, pick a case. I like camel case, uh, but or I like uh, snake case, but you can use camel case if you want. But the biggest thing is stay consistent. And then the other thing that uh, I've kind of grown a little bit in my own coding is use prefixes for like functions that are like the same or similar or part of a group. And I think that a package that does this really well is the string R package. I can't remember all of the string R functions, but because R Studio has autocomplete, What's nice about it, all I have to do is just type in str underscore and I could go through and I can find the function that I need. And so when I'm building functions and I have a group of functions, I always strive to maybe put them together by using some type of prefix because it's gonna make it easier for me to use. So um, some other good practices, I don't know why you would do these things, but because R is super flexible and super powerful, you can do these things. Um, the book suggests not to, but avoid overriding existing functions. So um, if, you're, if you're up for it, you can change the capital T to false. Don't know why you would do it, but you could. Uh, your concatenate function, you can turn into a 10. Okay, you could do that. Or you could turn your mean function into sum. You could do that. Um, R is flexible enough that you can do that. I don't know why you would do it, but the big kind of over big picture of this is try to avoid it <laughs> if at all possible. <laughs> um, so we talked about this already. Uh, I think Monsa kind of mentioned this. You know, use comments in your code. Talk about the why you're doing, or you know, try to avoid talking about the what and how, but kind of explain the why in your comments. So pretty much just kind of use comments to write it, but I think we're pretty familiar with that. And then this is the other thing that you could do is break your code up into easy to read chunks. Use those kind of headers. And this doesn't really work very well in our notebooks, but if you're doing an R script, it works pretty well. But what's nice about these things is, is that if you're using these kind of conventions, there's some tools in R Studio that can help you better navigate your code. So if you're using those things, you can use this thing down here at the bottom to kind of look through the different sections within your code. Or if you're somebody who likes to see an outline view in the upper right, you can click this outline thing and it will give you an outline of all the things that you have with those headers. And so I've used this a couple of times to see like where I'm at and it can help you easily navigate to things that you're looking for. So help yourself, help your future self by putting in those um, those specific kind of code breaks in there because it, it does help, especially if you have a very, very long script that you have. Um, we're at 53 and we're getting to conditions. Uh, what do you think, Ryan? 
Yeah, I'd say maybe let's pick it up next week if everybody's okay with that. Yeah, I think I think condition we could probably pick up conditions because yeah. there's a lot to there's a little bit to conditions that I don't think yeah. I could cover in five minutes. Yeah, it's probably better that way. But thank you. Thanks I know we are taking time, but it's the most important piece. You know, we need to to be yes. I, yeah, I agree. Condition flow is is important, so I don't I don't think we should spend five minutes just breezing yeah. through it because it's pretty important. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, it might push us back a week. So if you guys have like summer plans or whatever, just push those back a week. Or you know, if you're planning on starting school in the fall, just push that back a week because we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> take an extra week here. But it's all good. Um, no. Uh, Thank you very much, Colin, for for all the every, everything that you put together on this. It's a lot of information. It's really helpful, and uh, and I for one, I I appreciate the conversation. I think it's always good to explore the ideas, whatever comes up onto your mind. The, just talking about it, and uh, I know we all start our comments with like, I don't know if this is true, or I don't know if this is a real thing, or it doesn't make sense. And I wonder if like the experts watching this video. Are like oh what a what a bunch of crazy people that are just taking themselves down the down the wrong path and and if if you're one of those people join our next call and straighten this out so um, so with well, that uh, I don't have anything else to add we'll we'll pick it up I guess next Wednesday um, I, I don't have any intention of joining from the car next Wednesday so uh, so we'll start it off uh, at the right time so. But I hope everybody has a great week. And um, with that, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you next time. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.